Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to see you here today. I am excited about the opportunity to bring God's word, and I am thankful for Pastor Mercer allowing me that opportunity. I have been here at Cross Life on staff now for a month, and it has been an exciting time. I have really enjoyed getting to know the staff here. We have an incredible staff. Really enjoyed being under Pastor Mercer, such a great pastor. And so uh, it's been an exciting time. I already have the uh, Cross Life bumper sticker there on the back of my car, and so I'm settling in. My boys and my wife are here with us, and so it's been it's been great. And so over at East Campus, I've been telling I've been telling our our our, our group over there week in and week out, that I believe that God has great things in store for Cross Life, great things in store for East Campus, and so I am humbled that I am able to be a part of that. And so we're going to jump into the message this morning. I want to let you know the title of my sermon is called The Glorious Pursuit. The Glorious Pursuit. And this morning we're going to look at an incredible truth in this story, and what I want to do is I want to start off by reading two passages to kind of set the groundwork for what we're going to be talking about. The first one is in Luke chapter 19, turn with me to Luke chapter 19 and verse 9 through 10. Luke 19 verse 9 through 10 says this, and Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, as Jesus writes this, he was there at the house of Zacchaeus. Some of you might know that story. Uh, He came after Zacchaeus. He went over to Zacchaeus' house. He was relaxing over there, and he was was there with Zacchaeus, and he says this, today salvation has come, and he says this important thing in verse 10 that says, for the Son of Man, referring to himself, has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He came to seek, and in Matthew chapter 18, verse 11, jump over there with me, Matthew 18, verse 11, it also says this, Jesus says, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Now in this passage, Jesus was just talking about letting the little ones come to him, and then right after this, he tells a parable of a shepherd, a shepherd that goes after a lost sheep and pursues this lost sheep and goes after and seeks this lost sheep, and then he rejoices when the sheep is found. And so I wanted to kind of show you these things because we are going to be talking in this message today, a glorious pursuit. We're going to be talking about our Savior, Jesus Christ, who comes and he seeks us. He pursues us. He comes after us. And he loves us so much that he pursues you and me. And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. I want to start off telling you a little story about myself. Um, Some of you might not know me too well. I was raised in the mountains of East Tennessee and came from a large family. There were five of us in the good family, five kids. And so if anybody's from a large family, you know that Christmas time is a wild time. I mean, Christmas is a free-for-all. I mean, it just kind of gets out of control. You got Christmas paper flying left and right. Like, who gets to open this present? No, it's my turn. And so Christmas can be a crazy time. And for us, that's how it was growing up. Well, one Christmas, our, our parents decided they were going to do something really special for us. And so they said, we've got one present for all of you to share. So we get around and we open up this present and we open it up and there is a clue. And my parents decided they wanted to have us do a uh, scavenger hunt on Christmas morning. They thought it'd be a great idea for us to do a scavenger hunt. So there we are. The first clue leads us to the chicken house. Now I'm telling y'all, we were a bunch of country kids, okay? So here we are, we, we get out, we go over to the chicken house, we run over there, open it up, you know, we grab a chicken, and we grab a clue, and we look at the clue, and we see it, and it says, next place is the garden. So we go over to my mom's garden, we run over there, and we get to the garden, and we get the next clue, and it goes on and on, and one clue after another, and finally we get to the last clue. 
And I don't know why my parents thought this was a good idea, but they tied the last clue to our horse. No joke, they tied the clue to our horse. And so just imagine this with me. I mean, you can just see it in your head. A bunch of us country kids in our Christmas jammies coming out, we see the horse, the horse sees us, the horse is just terrified, all right? And we see the horse and we pursue this horse. Now the horse didn't really want to participate very much. And so the horse takes off and you have this scene, no joke, on Christmas morning, all of us five kids going after that horse, chasing that horse down everywhere it went. We would run after it, and finally we cornered it, and we got in the corner. It was terrified, but we grabbed the clue, and we read the last clue, which led us to the barn. And so we go to the barn, and we open up the barn, and there and behold, the glorious Christmas present, what every kid wants and loves, a trampoline. Woo! And we were just so excited, but... For us, with five kids, assembly was still required. We had to, obviously, with five kids, we had to put it together ourselves. But I tell you this whole story to tell you this. It was this, it was this journey for us on a Christmas morning where we had to go on a scavenger hunt, and we were going to do whatever it took to get the prize, to get the present. I mean, if there was a horse and a chicken house that stood in our way, if we had to run, over, run around all of these acres to get to there, we were going to do it because there at the end was this prize. And so we were going to pursue our Christmas present. We were going to seek out our Christmas present, and it didn't matter what was in our way. So this morning, I wanted you to kind of keep that in mind as we're talking about this glorious pursuit, and we're going to look at this story, how Jesus pursues this man. Now, I want to kind of give you just a little heads up. We're going to be reading a lot of different verses. We're going, to, we're going to be reading a lot of scripture, but I want to encourage you to stay with me because this is a really, really incredible thing that we're going to look at in these passages. So Mark chapter 4, verse 35, Mark chapter 4, verse 35 is where we're going to start off. Here's what it says. On that day when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. Now, I want to stop right there for just a moment just to let you kind of know what's going on here. Jesus turns to his disciples and says, let us go to the other side. Now, Jesus would do most of his ministry on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. And so he would do a lot of his ministry there. But one day he says, we are going to go to the other side, which was the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And over there was mostly inhabited by Greeks. It was a very dark place, a lot of sin, um, a lot of pagan worship and stuff. And so Jesus one day turns to his disciples and says, that's where we're going. Let's go to the other side. And so that's what we see here. Check this out. Verse 36, it says, leaving the crowd... They took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and the other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him, and they said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up, and he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Hush, be still." And the wind died, and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you ha still have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey? Now, let me ask you a question. How many of y'all have ever heard this story before? Raise your hand if you've ever heard the story. Probably quite a bit of, bit of us have heard this story before, but here's what we're going to do. We are just kind of passing through here. We're not, we could probably spend a whole sermon just on this one passage, but we are passing through here. But what we see here is that Jesus says, let's go to the other side, and they get in, and all of a sudden there's this storm that arose, and this was very typical here, and it, the storm arose, and the wind was blowing, and the water was coming over the boat, and Jesus was there sleeping on a cushion. And we see what happens here is that Jesus, they say, Jesus, do you not care about us? Like, do you even care that we're perishing? And Jesus gets up and Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves and everything goes still. And then they were astonished in this moment and they said, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? And so passing through, this is just, we're going to continue on here. Mark 5, verse 1, check this out. It says, they came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes. And when he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. 
And he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and shackles broken into pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. And constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gnashing himself with stones. All right? So they go through this big storm. They go to the other side, and the first person they come in contact with is this guy. Imagine this situation. The disciples are probably thinking, what? You know, what is this? We go through the storm, and this is the first person that we come in contact with, a man with an unclean spirit, a man who was demon-possessed. A man who was an outcast of society, they would put him in the tombs, in these caves, and they would shackle him, and they would chain him up in there, and he would scream every night, and people could hear him, and he was cutting himself with stones, and one of the other gospels says that he was unclothed, and he would run around, and and he was basically this menace to society, this outcast, this demon-possessed man, and they land on dry land, and they're probably like, whew, we're here, and this is the first person they come in contact with. The first person they see on the other side is this demon-possessed man. Now, probably, they're probably thinking, let's just jump back in the boat and go back to the other side. But here's what we see. We see this incredible interaction here in verse 6. Mark 5, 6, it says, Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and he bowed down before him, shouting with a loud voice. He said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, Do not torment me, for he had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. And now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. And the demons implored him, saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. And Jesus gave him permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank and into the sea, and about 2,000 of them there were drowned in the sea. And the herdsmen ran away and reported in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what had happened. All right? So Jesus doesn't just push away this man who was an outcast. Jesus has this incredible interaction with him where Jesus calls out this unclean spirit and calls out this legion and he takes this and he sends this legion of demons into these pigs and they run into the sea and they drown. And then all of these people come to see what's going on. Now you would think here that everybody would be excited. You would think that everybody would be thrilled that this man who had this unclean spirit, this man who was basically this outcast who was just screaming every night, you'd think that they would be thrilled But that's not the reaction that we see here from the people. Look what happens with the people. It says in verse 15, they came to Jesus. They observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine, and they began to, listen, verse 17, to implore him to leave their region. Very important. And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him, and he did not let him, but he said to them, but he said to him, go home to your people, report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim it in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed." So what we see here is we see the reaction from the people was, we don't want any part of what you're doing, Jesus. The reaction of the people was, it says in verse 17, that they implored, uh, they implored him to leave their region. These people came and they saw this guy sitting there and they're like, man, we, we, got, we want you out of here. We don't want anything to do with you. Please just get back in your boat and go back to the other side. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus got back into his boat and went back to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, I want us to think about this for a second because I think this is, I wanted you to see all this and I wanted you to read all this because this is an incredible thing that we see here. 
Because we know that Jesus, being fully God, fully man, came to this earth. We know that Jesus has all know, Jesus is all knowing, he is all powerful. We just saw that on display there in the sea when he rebuked the wind and the waves. So Jesus, being all knowing, knew whenever he turned to his disciples and he said, let us go to the other side, he knew that when they would get in the boat, They would go through this storm. They would go all the way over to the other side. And Jesus knew the first person that they would come in contact with was this man. And then Jesus knew that even though he went through all of this, he came to this one man, he knew that he would be turned away and implored to go back. But Jesus came anyways. You see, that's what's so incredible about this passage, because a lot of times we've probably heard these stories and we maybe have read through them, but what is so incredible is that Jesus came all the way to the other side. He went through this whole storm, brought his disciples through this whole storm, got all the way to the other side for this one man. He came to this one outcast man, a man that for most people had had written off, a man that people didn't want anything to do with, a man that was living in the tombs, and Jesus came all the way over to the other side for him. See, that's what's so incredible about this glorious pursuit, that Jesus came to seek and save that was lost, and this one man, he came for him. Now, I want you for a moment to put yourself in this man's situation. Think about how he wanted to go back with Jesus. I thought that's something that was really cool here. He wanted to go back with Jesus. He's like, take me with you. I mean, Jesus was the only one that paid him any attention, so he's like, take me with you. I want to get back in the boat with you. But Jesus told him to stay here. Imagine this being this man who, you know, that you're an outcast and how you, you know, you're basically worthless, and Jesus comes all the way over there for you. You know what I think is so incredible about this passage is the beauty of the gospel is on display here. Because as we look at this and we're like, wow, that's awesome that Jesus would go all the way over there for that one man. That's exactly what Jesus did for you and for me. That Jesus came to the other side. That and he came into our broken world. He stepped in into our world and came and he was tempted and he went through the cross and he went through the pain and he fully and he went through all of this for you and me. And so the beauty of this is we can see this and say, wow, that's incredible that Jesus would do this for this man. He did the same thing for you and for me. You see, that's why I love this passage and love what's going on here is that we can see how incredible the gospel is, that yet why we were still sinners, Jesus came and he died for us. He came and he died for you. He came and he took our place so that we can have a new life and a new direction just like this man. I want you to look at Philippians chapter 2. Verse 5 through 11, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11. This is talking about humility, and it gives us this, this perfect glimpse of what Jesus did for us. Here's what it says. Having this attitude in yourselves, which also is in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow, and those who are in heaven and on earth and on the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord for the glory of God the Father. You see, what's so incredible is what we see here is exactly what we're talking about. How Jesus, it says, came, he existed in the form of God, but he came in the likeness of men. He came, it says, as a bondservant. A bondservant is one who continues to serve even though they are free. And so Jesus came in the likeness of a man. He came as a man, and it says that he was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. 
And so we see this in Philippians. We see this incredible truth here that Jesus Christ loves us so much, a broken Jeremy that is worthless, that is hopeless, and he came and he stepped into this world on the other side and he paid the price for my sins and he rescued me. He pursued me and he pursued you too. There's an incredible truth here. I want you to think about this this morning. This man wanted to get back in the boat with Jesus. But Jesus said no. Jesus said your mission is here. Jesus said your mission is to stay here and to let everybody know what I've done for you. Now, I think oftentimes it's kind of difficult for us. We go through life and we're like, man, what is the purpose? Like, what am I doing here? Like, what's going on? You know, and sometimes life can be difficult. and It's almost like, man, Jesus, like, what am I doing here? It's like, I want to kind of get back in the boat with you, Jesus. Like, why? You're like, what's going on? Why am I on this earth? What Jesus is saying to us, he's saying, your mission is here. Your mission is to be my witnesses. Your mission is to make disciples. Your mission is to go around to everyone you know and proclaim who I am. Proclaim what I've done in your life. Proclaim how I've rescued you and I've pursued you. And so you and I are just like this man where we have a mission here in Oviedo, in East Orlando, to proclaim the name of Jesus, to tell everyone what he has done for us, to let everyone know how incredible our God is and that he pursues them just like he pursued you. So we have a mission. We have a purpose to stay and to proclaim the name of Jesus. So I wanna ask you this morning, knowing what Jesus had done for you, knowing that Jesus came to the other side and stepped in for you, how far are you willing to go to reach people? Are you willing to go to the other side? Are you willing to go to the other side of the office where that person is and to tell them about Jesus and to tell them about what he's done for you? Are you willing to go to the other side of the neighborhood where you know there's that neighbor who doesn't know Christ? Are you willing to go to them and say, this is what Jesus has done for me and what he can do for you? Are you willing to go to, the, to that family member that you know is lost and that you just have a burden for and that you're broken for and go to them and say, listen, Christ loves you and this is what he did for me and what he can do for you? Students, are you willing to go to that person on the other side of the cafeteria who doesn't know Christ and let them know what Jesus has done for you? Are you willing to, to, to do what this, what this one man did, this demon-possessed man did, and go to everybody and let them know that Jesus has saved you? The reaction will be, people will be amazed. You know what I think is really encouraging in this passage? That if you go back to Mark, go to Mark chapter 7. And in verse 31, we see something very interesting here. Mark chapter 7, verse 31, it says, Again, he went out from the region of Tyre and came through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of Decapolis. Jesus goes back. Jesus goes back to this place. He goes back there, and what we see here is he heals this deaf man. And he heals, he heals him, and what we see here in verse 37, it says this, and they were utterly astonished, saying, he has done all of these things well, and he makes even the deaf hear and the mute to speak. You see, the same people that turned Jesus away, the same people that didn't want anything to do with Jesus, now are seeing things differently, and this crowd is saying, man, this Jesus has done things all well, and he makes even the deaf hear and the mute speak. You see, our job is to continue to proclaim it and proclaim it and proclaim it, and eventually people are going to see that this Jesus is real, that Jesus loves them, and that Jesus pursues them. I want to share with you a story of uh, about, it was about six years ago, I took a group of uh, students on a mission trip. We were doing some mission work in inner city Nashville and some different neighborhoods. And we had, um, we'd had our last night, we were all in this room and we were all meeting and it was a really an emotional time. Everyone was sharing about kind of what, what God had done throughout that week. And this one guy in particular was really broken because um, he had realized what Jesus had done in his life and gave his life to Christ. And so all of us were just kind of in this celebratory moment where we were just excited about Jesus. 
and we were going around the room and we were kind of sharing about what God had done in our lives and we came, it came to this one guy, his name was Boom, and he was a foreign exchange student from Thailand. And he had actually extended his time and his stay in the States so that he could join us on this trip. And so he didn't believe in Jesus. He, he actually claimed to be a Buddhist, but he went on this mission trip with us, which was really cool. And he got to uh, serve alongside of us and he got to see kind of what we were about. And so this last night we were sitting in the circle and, it, and we're going around and it finally comes to him. It, go, it goes to him. And he stands up and, you know, I'm, I was just thinking the whole time, like, what's he going to say? And he stands up and he goes over to this map on the wall and he goes and he looks at the map and he points at the map and he says, this is, my, this is my home. This is Thailand where I'm from. And he says, I have experienced this week seeing that Jesus is real. He said, I have seen how you've cried. I've seen tears come down your faces. I've seen what you've done to serve him. And this has been like six years, so I'm kind of paraphrasing what he said. But he goes, I have, I, have seen, I have seen Jesus in your life, and I have seen that you truly believe him. But he said this. He said, but if you really believe Jesus is who he says he is, then why am I not seeing more people in my country, in my home country, telling people about Jesus? He said, why, I, why haven't I heard more and more about Jesus? If you believe he really is who he says he is and he really rescued you and saved you. And I remember that moment, like it just, it's always something that just really impacted my life. Because as I was thinking about this, his perspective where growing up he had hardly heard the name of Jesus and then I thought about us in this room, as us believers who have known who Jesus is, and I think about sometimes my lack of sharing that and how I, sometimes I'm not bold with the gospel. It had an impact on me. And so what, I, what, it, what it encouraged me to do was to be someone who opens my mouth all the time about Jesus. To be someone who goes around and proclaims to people what Jesus has done for me. And so not just Thailand, because we do have missionaries in Thailand, but not just Thailand, but Oviedo and East Orlando. And so that's why I'm excited to be here at Cross Life and to be a part of a team and a church that is serious about reaching people, that is serious about making disciples, that is serious about seeing people come to Christ. I'm excited to be able to join you as we are people that are going around and letting people know about what Jesus has done in our life and how he has pursued us and how he loves us. Amen. Would you pray with me this morning? Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray. God, I pray for us to be more bold. God, I thank you for this message. God, I thank you for this story. God, I thank you for what you have done for us, God. Lord, I thank you for this incredible truth that we got to explore today. Lord, and how you pursue us. And Lord, I pray this morning, God, that we will be more bold with your gospel. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. We're going to have a time of response and invitation time. And here's, here's what I want to speak to this morning. Number one, if you're in this room and you're a Christian this morning, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to be just like this demon-possessed man who was going out and proclaiming what Jesus has done for you. I want to encourage you today to go to God and say, I want to be more bold. I want to let people know about what you've done for me. So if you're a Christian in this room, I want during this response time, I want to encourage you to spend time with the Lord and say, God, use me, give me opportunities. I pray that I will be faithful in going to the other side and reaching people for you, God, letting people know that you pursue them, that you love them. If there's somebody, the second thing is, if there's somebody in this room this morning and Maybe this is, maybe you're just kind of hearing this and you're like, wow, this is incredible. Like Jesus pursues me, that Jesus loves me. That is, that is an incredible truth that I hope that you've heard and understand today. That Jesus loves you so much that he pursues you just like this man that we talked about. That he loves you so much that he came here for you, searching and seeking you. That he laid his life down on the cross for you. And so what I want to encourage you today is if, you just, if, you're, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've never turned your heart, your life, and surrendered over to him, I want to encourage you this morning to do that today. To surrender your life to Christ. 
just to go to him and say, Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for rescuing me from my sins. Thank you for, for paying the price for me. I believe that you died for me. I want to follow you. I want to surrender my life to you. Forgive me of my sins and make me new. And if you do that today, man, Jesus comes in and Jesus sets you on a new path and you are a follower of Jesus, a Christian, the most, the greatest decision that you will ever make. And so what I want to encourage you to do is this morning, if you have decided to give your life to Christ, come and let somebody know. Let some of the guys up front come down. Let them know. It is the greatest decision that you will ever make. So I encourage you to come and talk to the guys down front that you made that decision and they want to encourage you and follow up with you and to share with you what it means to be a follower of Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we just, God, we worship you, God, this morning, God. We, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this message, Lord. We thank you for what you've done for us, God, how you stepped out of heaven into this broken world, God, and why we were, your, why we were still enemies, Lord, you died for us. God, we thank you for this realization today, God. We thank you for your word, God. I pray that we will continue to proclaim your name to everyone we come in contact with. We pray this in your name. Jesus' name, amen.